Hello and welcome back. I'm sorry it's been a couple of weeks since my last video. I've been a bit busy with a few things. Uh, one of which I'd like to show you, as I think a few of you might be interested in it. So I'll show you that first and then I'll let you know a bit more about this big chunk of wood that I have on the lathe. Okay, so a few weeks ago I was lucky enough to come into possession of my grandfather's old woodworking planes which had been left sitting in a box in the back of my father's garage for a number of years and they were just recently uncovered and my mother said it would be okay for me to have them and restore them and then get the use of them when they are back to their former glory. So I have in this box here the other planes. This is a Stanley Bailey number four. Uh, this one is a record number four and a half. This one here is a record five and a half. And this cool looking one here is a record, I think it's number 78. And it's a rebate plane that has the depth stop and the guide fence on it as well. So I'm going to take some time to restore these and get them back to their former glory. I have this one here, which I've already uh, been working on. This is a Stanley Bailey number six. And uh, this one was quite covered in rust as well. Not too bad, but I bought some evaporust and disassembled it and let it soak in that solution overnight. And it came out pretty clean after that. I haven't uh, taken the time to polish this one up yet. I still plan on smoothing off the bottom and the sides and polishing them up a bit. And the chip breaker and iron need a little bit of work as well. But I scrubbed the inside of the plain body and gave it a fresh coat of black enamel paint and uh, scrubbed up the uh, I can't remember what this piece is called. I'm sure someone does in the video and they'll leave a comment below about it. Uh, but I scrubbed it up and put a bit of paint on the inside there to really bring out the Stanley logo. And I tidied up these original handles as well. These handles are uh, made of beech. So uh, that's something I'm going to be working on over the next couple of weeks. Uh, I may make a video of uh, restoring one of them or all of them if that's something you might be interested in so if that is something that you'd like to see leave a comment below if you'd like to see a particular one or if you'd just like to see a video of each one and the process that i go through to restore it and if you are interested in it i'll maybe do a video of the polishing up of this one just to give it that last little uh, bit of rejuvenation so that it can look its best. So uh, back to what is on the lathe. Right, so if you are a regular viewer of my channel and you've been subscribed for a year or two now, then you'll remember, I believe it was towards the end of 2017, uh, I was lucky enough to score a large haul of freshly cut elm. And within that haul, there was what I believe to be a rather large burr or burl of elm and I've been saving it for a while for the right kind of project to cut into that and to get a couple of blanks out of and so what we have here is a piece of that if you're not familiar with that video I'll put a card up in the corner of this video so that you can have a chance to go back and see that and see what this looked like when I had just uh, picked it up and taken it home but it's been well over a year now that uh, this piece of wood has been drying. And now that I've kind of got it on the lathe and trued it up a bit so that it wouldn't uh, fly off and kill me, uh, I'm starting to wonder if it really was a burr or if it was perhaps a tree canker that had some burr uh, growing on the top of it. Uh, either way, whichever one it is, there is some remarkable grain on top of this piece of wood so I'll take you in close to have a look at it and explain what this will ultimately end up being. Okay so here is the beast as you can see there is some pretty remarkable uh, swirly grain in this piece 
it certainly goes in all kinds of uh, different directions. There's a few bar conclusions. There's a pretty nasty one here. Uh, but what I aim to turn this into is a large pedestal urn kind of uh, table lamp. It's going to be a large feature lamp for my brother who's uh, nearing the end of his home renovations. And uh, he's asked that I can make him a large table lamp. So that is what I intend this to be. Uh, I have laid out a few pencil lines for the kind of proportions that I want to get here. This main part here in the middle is going to sweep down like a, a large uh, iron pedestal. And up at the top here, it will come to an OG short sort of shape. And I'll actually be gluing another piece on top of here to have just a bit more height. And that will be a decorative part that the bulb holder will then be mounted on. And down here, there will be a, a cove and then an OG foot. So that's the plan that I have for this. What I plan to do first um, is bore the through hole for the power cable and then turn the rough shape and then I'm going to leave it to sit for a few weeks. I've ordered parts for the lamp which won't be uh, available for me until the end of March. Right, so as I mentioned earlier, the first thing I'll do is bore the through hole for the power cable. And I'll do that using this long boring rod, which is part of the Record Power Long Hole Boring Kit. Uh, so I have in the tailstock a hollow centre, which will allow me to pass this down through the workpiece until I've gotten halfway, and then I could flip it around and bore the rest of the way through. I won't speak any more about it, as I feel like I've already said too much already. If you're interested in knowing more about this kit and the process of doing this, I'll put a link to another video of a lamp I made a few years ago that you can check out that goes quite in depth to the process of boring a hole for a power cable. Okay, that's halfway through now. It's only taken uh, three or four minutes in order to get halfway. It is a bit longer than if I was going to just use an auger bit, but it's quite tricky to find an auger bit uh, the size of something that you're going to work on and also to keep it going straight and true through the workpiece you're using. So I really like having this long hole borer to be guaranteed a perfectly straight hole through the the workpiece. So I'll get this turned around and in another few minutes the hole will be bored all the way through. Right so the hole is fully bored through the center of this blank. I'll do my best to let you see that. There it is, that was easier than I thought. So I've got a lovely clear hole straight through the centre of this piece, which means as I mount it back on the lathe between this point, I'll be guaranteed that this hole will be down the exact centre of the black, which will make turning it a little bit easier. So I'll get this mounted back on the lathe.
Okay, so I've just parted down to the depth I want for the transition between the body of the, the urn shape uh, transitioning down into the foot. So with that thickness there now, I'll begin to get rid of all of this waste and get an idea of the shape for that urn body. Okay, so we've suffered a minor setback as this piece of the blank has come out. I did see before I started turning it that there did look to be a bit of ring shake on this part and right enough, this has just come clean off. In here was uh, full of uh, quite moist feeling fibres uh, of the growth ring that had just rotted away. So I think with a little clean up, I think that will just glue back in there and I'll be able to keep on turning. So I've already done it a little bit, I've taken a drill with a wire brush in the end of it just to remove any of those loose fibres. So I'll do that for a little bit more just to make sure that all those loose fibres are gone. Same on this piece as well. And then I'm going to use a blowtorch just to make sure that these two faces are bone dry before gluing it so that I can have a good adhesion between these two pieces before I continue turning.
Okay, so that's the glue on now, and I'll leave it for a few days over the weekend to fully cure before starting to turn this. Hopefully, this will have uh, a decent glue joint between it, and it will stay in there while I do the rest of the turning. I think most of this will end up turning away as I bring it down to the the finished diameter down at the transition. Okay, so I left that glue to dry over the weekend, so it's had two full days to fully cure and uh, lunchtime today I went over it a little bit to see what sort of uh, joint we've got here and it looks pretty good for the most part there's still a little bit of a opening up at this top part of it but I think as I begin to shape this a bit more that is likely to close up and I also rounded this down to pretty much its widest diameter uh, dimension. I put some marks on for where I'm going to have transitions. So between here and here will be a cove and between this line and this line will be an OG shape and then there'll be a slight round over going on to that OG for the base. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, so it's actually been quite a while since uh, that last part that I recorded. Um, this has been sitting on the lathe for at least a week and a few days since that last turn. And in that time I've decided not to uh, fill the cracks with resin, as they're quite small, apart from the ones up in this top uh, OG here. Uh, they're quite small, so resin's not really going to do a great deal. So what I've done, and I've done it off camera, is uh, use a syringe and I've filled it with uh, thin CA first and then medium CA and actually gone down into the bigger cracks to fill them up and uh, thin CA just on the, the small ones to stabilise it so that it's not going to shift and open up as much once the lamp is finished. Uh, I've also turned the hole or cut the hole for the cable to come through and I've cut a little mortise in the top as well uh, as a guide for a Fossner bit when I bore the mortise for the trumpet that is going to go on the top. So uh, the lampshade has uh, been delivered as well and I have the parts ordered for the wiring of it. So I've decided as it hasn't moved very much in the time that it's been left on the lathe that I'm just going to go ahead and start finishing it. So I'm going to start off by giving it its first coat of oil and then I'll sand with the oil a little bit just to fill in a bit more of these cracks here with the, uh, the mix of oil and sawdust and I'll let that sit overnight to harden and uh, I'll repeat that two or three times until I've got a nice, nice smooth and even surface. Right, so it's had two coats of finishing oil and two coats of teak oil. And between those coats of oil, I've sanded with 320 and 400 grit to denib it and bring it to a smooth surface. And now it is already lovely and smooth, but just to give me a prepared surface before I put on the wax coat, I'm going to go over it with some Yorkshire grit.
Okay, that looks and feels good. So I'll go ahead now and put on the top coat of Hampshire Sheen High Gloss. Okay, so that is the main lamp body finish now, and I've got a wonderful top coat of Hampshire Sheen High Gloss on here. It's really bringing out the character and the grain of this piece of vellum, and I think when this lamp is finished, it's going to look really quite stunning. It's got some wonderful figure in here. I still have a little bit of tidying up to do in this little bar conclusion here, just to pick out uh, what is left of the wax that hasn't gone on to the wood so apart from that this is looking pretty spectacular i'm going to end the video here and do the part that's going to go on the top in a future video and the final assembly as well so stay tuned for that i hope you've enjoyed this video 
Thank you to all of my subscribers for continuing to support me and watch my videos. And if you haven't yet subscribed, please subscribe and take the time to have a look at my other videos. As always, thanks for watching and I'll see you in part two.